welcome to the Drexel Interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohen, speaking to you from the university's picture gallery. Today our guests are architects Todd Williams and Billy Chen. Mr. Williams and Ms. Chen are married, as well as being creative partners, and were recently chosen to design the new building that will house the Barnes Foundation collection when it makes its move from Marion, Pennsylvania to the Ben Franklin Parkway in Center City, Philadelphia. Todd Williams and Billy Chen, welcome to the Drexel interview. Thank you. Well, congratulations on this commission. It's a controversial one. Our viewers know, and many of our viewers have been following closely, um, the decision that has been made to move the Barnes collection uh, from Marion to Center City. And I wonder, first of all, how you feel uh, about this move, or perhaps that's not the way to put it, how your feeling about the move contributed to your ideas about what you would do um, in putting forward a design idea. And I guess I'll ask Billy to start with that answer. Well, it's really interesting because, of course, as we became involved with the Barnes Foundation, we really paid a lot of attention to what Dr. Barnes felt was his original mission. And that was to educate people and bring these works of art and an understanding and appreciation of them to as many people as possible. And so in that way, uh, I feel very comfortable and very positive about moving uh, the Barnes to downtown Philadelphia because I think it opens it up to many more people than have been able to have access to it while it's been in Marion. Okay, I know that was the central rationale yeah. for the move, and yet there are many people that still oppose it strongly. Yeah. Uh, so you're involved with a controversial project here. Well, I, I think that we're interested in, in being involved in any project that uh, has a heart and soul, and this certainly does, and where the heart and soul are something that are worth fighting over. And so trying to locate that and, and determine what that is and make sure that that still beats in the right way, even if it beats in a slightly different way, is really what we're, we're after in our work. And so this is a, an incredibly interesting assignment, and one, not one we're going to take lightly, and, and one that we every day learn more and more about. Hmm. Well, it's certainly challenging. I have to say that the day after there was a series of presentations uh, to the Barnes Committee uh, for the new design, of which your, your, your ideas were one, I happened to see Derek Gilman, because I happened to be at the Barnes and I spoke to him. And he was so excited about the array of presentations that had been given. Uh, there were quite a number of architects involved who were vying for this commission. And it was interesting because he was speaking with such enthusiasm about what he had been, he had seen. Such an array, so much talent, he said, and so many ideas that were exciting. And then to find out that you had won this commission and that I was going to be able to interview with you was very exciting. So tell me, us, what it is about your ideas that you think uh, were unique. Um, and that may have made that difference. Well, it's hard. I think that I, I was surprised and a little disappointed that everyone had great ideas. <laughs> now, were you all you were all present for each other's no, we ideas? Weren't. No, no, okay. we weren't. It was and it was a very discreet interview where uh, the the board really interviewed the architects with the uh, with many of the staff looking at the presentation, and then uh, the staff left the room, and the Barnes uh, board would interview us in greater detail. Uh, and it was a very exciting interview because uh, in, indeed we each brought a different idea to the table. And I would say that our idea we think is marvelous, but I think it's not without, you know, we can, it can be challenged. And we will in fact go out and try to challenge the idea to make sure it's the right idea. Because uh, in many ways I think that the first idea can be the best idea, but it also can be something that can evolve and get better. Well, I think one of the major aspects of um, our thinking was, you know, you can either accept uh, the mandate of the judge or you can try to figure ways to get around it. I mean, that was, that was sort of, you can either go this way or this way when you start to think about the project. Now, wait, let me stop you here. The mandate of the judge being? That the, that the galleries need to be replicated okay. in the sequence in which they occur. In okay. other words... Yeah replicate what is the existing 
set of galleries. So, it, I mean, it's a huge challenge, and I think what we decided to do was to embrace it and to really accept that this is uh, this is the, the the major sort of focus. It's a constraint, but it's also a kind of um, a very interesting. It makes this project very interesting. The constraint. Mm. Um, to, to replicate the gallery and keep the sequence the same. And I think that maybe made us somewhat different, perhaps, than some of the other people. Well, I don't know, but the, the uh, one's first instinct, the creative person's first in instinct, is probably to slip out of the assignment or to do it in some different way. And, uh, and certainly, the very first, our first ideas were to challenge the judge's ruling. But as we talked about it over the months and thought more deeply about it, it became ever more interesting, actually, to instead read as carefully as possible the judge's um, resolution. And, uh, and in doing that, we sort of began to dive in, actually, into the minds not only of the judge, but the way the judge was interpreting Dr. Barnes. And it, and it actually became more and more exciting. Uh, so we, we basically did accept that the paintings in those spaces, if it were these walls, red walls with dark wainscoting and paint, paintings in the sequence, would be assembled in that exact uh, way and also in, room to room in the, in the identical way that they, uh, uh, they are presented today. So there will be within the galleries a tremendous sense of, of scale and intimacy that exists uh, in the, in the Marion galleries today. But then I guess the context within which that is placed will be different Precisely, with your own vision. Yeah. Well, and, and that's right. The context will mean a great deal. We also read into uh, the brief that we saw that the Barnes today exists in a garden. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the parkway is to some extent a garden, but it's, a, it's not the intimate garden that exists out in Marion. But if we accept the fact that the Barnes must be in a garden, we also realized that many of the paintings refer to garden and, and landscape conditions. So we all imagine that our concept was to not only put the gar barns back in a garden, but bring the garden into the museum. So we don't have an exact answer to, to that, but we have several museums we cited as ones that we admire. Uh, they're maybe a little more traditional, but the Frick in New York is one of these and the Isabel Gardner Museum in, in uh, Boston is another one. Whether or not we're actually able to bring landscape into the building in that way, we don't know, but it would be appropriate if we can, and if it, the, the project as it plays out works that way, it might be interesting, and it would, again, try to bring some of that incredibly intimate and, and uh, landscape-related world into the, as a context for the new building. Okay, that's great. I, I know you've worked with landscape in other projects, mm -hmm. which we'll look at in a moment, mm -hmm. But um, I'm, I'm struck by uh, this idea that you are thinking, I mean, I, it must be interesting for you as creative people to be in a situation where, in a sense, you have to uh, channel another's vision or translate someone else's vision. Is, is this, was that part of what you initially balked at and then eventually sort of succumbed to, that you were going to subordinate yourself to some extent, and then you saw that it really wasn't that? Um, when you go to see the collection, you feel the strong hand of the person who's installed it. I mean, even because every time you look at a wall, it's symmetrical in terms of the hanging of the paintings. Yeah. And... You know, that, so it's a kind of bilateral symmetry, like a body. So there's a right hand and a left hand, and you're always looking at the right hand and the left hand. And, a, and in a certain way, my first reaction was, I don't want to look at these paintings the way you want me to look at them. <laughs> um, but at the same time, um, I admired the very strong sense of a personal vision. And I think that's something that's really missing in museums today, that there's no sense of a kind of personality behind the hanging. And in a, in a way, as things become more and more globalized, I walk into the Museum of Modern Art in New York and I feel like I could be in any one of a number of international cities. Yeah. So I think... In that way, we want to embrace that sense of a very personal vision. And it will be important in this new building to, as Todd said, 
bring and continue to have that sense of intimacy so you have a very personal, even if you don't agree with it, very personal experience with the art because that's what the Barnes is about. Well expressed. I just wanted to add one thing that you made me think of, which was during that visit with Derek Gilman, he pulled the, the blinds, and which are usually closed for various reasons, and the light came in. And that's something that is, I guess there will be more light. Uh, the paintings really can't be seen that well in the present condition. I think some people don't realize what's being lost. Yeah. Did your design or your ideas involve light? Well, they certainly do. That's uh, though we can't be specific, and and in fact, we are going to explore different way, different li different lighting desire, designers and different ways of illuminating the galleries. But there's no question that we felt the galleries were a little gloomy, uh, and that the moment natural light comes into space, it it uh, it lifts one's spirits and it shows the 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 work and the way in which it was undoubtedly conceived in natural light and, and the way Dr. Brown's ri originally presented it. So we hope we can do something like that. Uh, it wasn't an integral part of our design, um, but I think what Billy's describing, which is that we, we wanted to assure them that our commitment is to create something that is intimate, personal, uh, and that has a clear uh, idea behind it, uh, even if it's and the Dr. Barnes idea is certainly relative to the paintings and the hanging of the paintings is intact and yet our building and the site, the way in which we cite it and the way in which we are sensitive to the context is, is, uh, has the same personality that we, that he did even if it's our own. Um, well, I want to talk a little bit about some of your previous work. You've had so many commissions in recent years, um, among them the um, Whitney Museum of Mer American Arts downtown branch, Hereford College at the University of Virginia, and then several images of other places I have here, the Museum of Folk Art in New York City and the new Skirkanich Hall right down the street at the University of Pennsylvania. Well, um... It was very exciting because the Folk Art Museum is actually the first uh, from the ground museum uh, that was built in New York, I think, since uh, the Whitney Museum. Mm. So it's tiny, though. So its footprint, there's, it's only 40 feet by 100 feet deep. And where is um, it located? It's located right next to the Museum of Modern Art on 53rd Street. It's 45 West 53rd Street. But um, folk art is art that's done by people who are not trained to be artists. And so in that way, there's a very direct connection between, I think, their, their technique, their hand, and their sort of heart. It doesn't kind of go through a... Um, a trained filter. Yeah, a sort mind. of sense of theory or anything. We wanted to allow that same sense of personal experience, similar to what's going on what we hope will happen at the barns um, between the visitor um, and the folk art at this museum. So uh, the spaces, rather than being a, a sort of white box, are much more in scale with something that might feel like a large townhouse. Um, and I think what that does is it both gives you uh, physically the ability to be closer but it also makes each floor sort of different and interesting. So instead of um, being able to understand a floor immediately because you walk in and you see everything, you need to walk through to discover it, uh, to slowly discover it. Folk art is, is of course, it's done by, it's also coming, comes of two ages. It's often Pennsylvania, a lot of great folk, folk art comes from Pennsylvania. Indeed, the Barnes collection has a, has a redware collection out in the countryside, apparently, that's a curfew that is a is a wonderful and the best redware collection there is. So, during that process, we became familiar with the traditional folk art, of which we determined we actually had a few pieces, and then also the more contemporary kinds of folk art, which is often from people who are maybe incarcerated or who have mental il illness. And these are two very different, distinct kinds, but again, they both come from. Uh, really from the interior, from the, the heart, the soul of the person. And they're also extremely intimate because they are a person's idea, not, again, as Billy said, a theory. So that was a, that was a tremendous learning exercise, and I think there's a relationship.